Hi guys, welcome to Pointy Not Sharp. Today we're taking a look at the pattern of 1895 Martini Enfield Socket Bayonet. Now these were made for the Martini Enfield Mark 1, Mark 2 and Mark 3 rifles. And the Martini Enfield, if you're not familiar with it, is a, a Martini a Henry chambered in 303 British essentially. And while these were made for the long rifles, they will not fit the carbines. Uh, they take the um, pattern of 1888 uh, bayonet. Now these weren't made brand new. They were actually converted from pre-existing uh, pattern of 1876 uh, spike bayonets uh, that were made for the Martini Henry rifles. And the conversions were carried out by uh, Enfeld from uh, 19, 1895 to 1902. And according to uh, Ian Scanton's book, there was 86,234 of these made in total. The history leading up to the development of this bayonet here is quite interesting. So the English at the time were using the Le Lee Metford uh, repeating rifle, which was a rifle chambered in 303 British, but with a black powder propellant. Now, smokeless powder had already been developed by the French with their Lavelle rifles, and uh, the British were trying to develop the perfect um, cartridge for a new rifle and they came up with something they liked in 1894 I believe it was which was the 303 British with cordite or smokeless spaghetti. Now the Lee Medford took the pattern of 1888 bayonet and um, because they only had a few at that stage they couldn't produce enough because the British Empire was just such a big place they were also converting older Martini Henry rifles into a Martini Medford configuration. They also took the pattern of 1888 bayonet, but they were relatively expensive bayonets to produce. In 1894, they had trials and they finally decided on the new cartridge that they liked and uh, a new rifle, being uh, the short magazine, sorry, the long magazine Lee Enfield. In addition to these new rifles, they were also using, or they were also converting uh, Martini, Henry rifles, Martini Henry rifles into the Martini Enfield configuration, which was a Martini Henry in 303 British with the new smokeless powder. Now, they didn't want to spend a lot of money on these rifles because they were a stopgap, a temporary thing, and they wanted something, uh, a cheap alternative. So they decided to start modifying pre-existing bayonets that they already had. So three modifications were really used, and the modifications were really, really cheap, like, um, from what I read, it was like two shillings or something per bayonet, or two S, whatever S is an abbreviation for at the time. So three abbreviate uh, three um, modifications made were they cut down the socket and reduced the diameter of it because uh, the old Martini Henrys had much larger barrels and a much bigger uh, caliber than the new uh, 303. They also extended this piece just here, which goes over the front sight, the new front sight was significantly taller, so that had to be extended. And finally, because they have a smaller socket, they had to have a smaller locking ring. So as you can see here, locking ring is currently unlocked. Push it to the side, locked. That's how they use it. So because we've got a smaller diameter socket, we had to have the smaller socket ring to go with it. Other than those three changes, everything else remained the same. The blade remained the same, and they used the same Mark I and Mark II leather scabbards as before. Now, I have a range of dates as to when this actually occurred. So, I've seen that it was adopted in May 16, 1895, approved on the 4th of October, 1895, and formally introduced on the 1st of February, 1896. So, it's a lot of dates there. I hope that makes sense to someone. And these are in service for some time. Uh, in the UK, they stayed in service throughout the First World War in like a rear uh, role. And in other countries, because these were primarily shipped out to the colonies with all the good stuff being left for the UK, uh, places like India and New Zealand, these are in service all the way up until World War II. And um, on top of that, they did see actual service uh, overseas. So... The uh, Martini Enfield rifle saw service in the Anglo-Boer War. I don't know if this bayonet was used because many of the Australian variations of the Martini Enfield took the pattern 1888 bayonet instead of this. And uh, I believe it was the Australians that took the Martini Enfield, but these could have seen service there as well. I don't know. On top of that, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, his uh, Arab Irregulars 
during the Ar Ar revolt of the 1916 to 1918, they used these in big numbers as well. And these are also used all throughout Afghanistan where they were also uh, copied in uh, Khyber Pass. So there's all kinds of stuff out there. Anyway, we'll jump into the construction. So I generally, I'm not much of a socket guy, but we've got a uh, triform socket with a fuller running down each of the three surfaces. It is a very, very long bay uh, bayonet, terminating in what's actually quite a good point there, quite sharp. Then moving down, I don't know what you call this. I think this is the shoulder here. My nomenclature for sockets isn't great, but the shoulder is rounded. And I can't tell if it's been brazed onto the blade or what, but yeah. And uh, the socket has been heavily blued while the blade itself is still in the white. And uh, looking at the muzzle ring, as you can see, it is significantly smaller than the Martini Henry uh, sockets. And again, just having a look at the locking ring, because I've never really paid much attention to these before and figured out how they work. Literally, the front sight slides in through this hole here, and then you twist it, slides through there, and then you lock it in place by pressing that down. Very, very simple. And uh, these were actually fitted underneath the barrel. So nearly all triform socket bayonets were to the right, whether this is one of the only ones I'm aware of that sat um, below, which is quite interesting. Then moving down to the scabbard, as I said, it's just a standard scabbard for a pattern of 1876. We've got what looks to be a uh, brass locket and brass chape, with a little drainage hole down the bottom. And uh, yeah, we've got a little stud there, got a very English looking frog stud, and a couple of rivets holding in place. I find it very interesting just because it's a triangular blade scabbard. It's um, not what I'm used to. There's no markings on the leather. I don't know where, where it was made, but this would be exceedingly old. The only thing left to really discuss is the markings. And I'm not the greatest <laughs> with um, Victorian era uh, English markings. I find them a little bit tricky, but some of them are quite simple and I'll go through what I do understand so here on the blade we have a date of manufacture and that's not the date the whole thing was manufactured that's the date that it was converted to the model of sorry the pattern of 1895 by uh, Enfeld now the actual manufacture dates on the original bayonets they weren't actually marked with those until the 21st of July 1882 so you can have some of these with two manufacture marks or just one so this is likely one of the early ones this one here is made in 1896, so this is one of the very first ones that was um, made or converted. On top of that, we have our government acceptance marks, like a little broad arrow. We've got one up here, it's pretty poorly stamped, maybe even be double stamped. And to my eye, it looks like an Australian one, which I thought the Australians used the pattern of 1888 instead of these sockets, but maybe I'm wrong and it is, I don't know. Then we also have our uh, Enfeld um, inspection marks, and you'll find that on the scabbard as well, just here. And finally, there's a bit of a mystery marking. So I've got an M just here, and I don't have the slightest idea what it means. Um, I've seen that Indian ones have an I on them to designate they were for India, and I know like South Africa will likely have SA. I don't know where M could have gone or what that could mean. Um, if you know, comment below, because it, it's well and truly got me beat. And a number of these bayonets also ended up in places like Egypt, and you'll find um, Arabic numbers, like rack numbers or serial numbers, etched on other surfaces of the blade. Um, and you may even have unit markings on them as well. But again, I'm no pro at British unit markings. Anyway, guys, that's all I've really got to say about this bayonet here. If I've left out a lot of key information, which I probably have because I'm not a socket guy, please comment below. I'd love to uh, hear from you and see what you have to say. And thanks for watching.